Hi friends, welcome to the War Heroes channel. Today, we will talk about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant, Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Let's try together to understand the reasons for the defeat of Paulus' army in Stalingrad. Shortly before the 20th July, I had sought out General von Seidlitz in Krasnogorsk. He briefed me on the developments in the central sector of the Eastern Front. In 14 days, the Red Army had pushed more than 350 kilometers to the west along a front some 300 kilometers wide. At the beginning of the offensive, they had conquered territory the size of Holland, Belgium, and Switzerland. Up until the 9th July, a further 14 German generals had been captured and four had fallen. Worth knowing was that for the first time a large formation, the remains of the 12th Corps under the command of Lieutenant General Vincent Muller had laid down its arms. By the middle of July 1944, the number of generals taken prisoner in the central sector had risen to 26, and at least 15 others had fallen. Army Group Mitt had been defeated. From Lake Pepys to Galas, the Wehrmacht was fleeing back westwards under the blows of the Red Army. Arno von Linsky, who sought me out the next day, took on the formalities of my acceptance as a member of the League of German Officers. I was inwardly relieved that I no longer had to take this step. Looking back to clarify my way from the end of the cauldron battle on the Volga, it seemed that as an active enemy of Hitler's I had been tardy and resistant. It was a fact. I had had many hurdles to cross to get through to the right theoretical acknowledgement of the military, political and moral situation of Hitler's Germany. In Stalingrad, Hitler and his regime were unveiled as representing a system of cynical contempt and common betrayal. But I personally believed that I had gone the right way. Would I now be a traitor? Could I endanger my family in the homeland? Could I separate myself from the honored Field Marshal Paulus? The answers to these questions needed time to mature. A further way must be found for answering the question how I, as a prisoner of war, could contribute to the overthrow of Hitler and what would happen afterwards. And for me then, just as I had achieved theoretical clarity over these conflicting problems, something else was necessary. The decisive, perhaps also the worst, civil courage. That was not like bravery in war. Behind bravery in war stands either directly or indirectly the order of the superior commander. The civil courage necessary for Germany to rise up against Hitler could not be based on that kind of order. Quite the contrary, it means the rejection of such orders. It conflicted with the voice of conscience and reason. During the next few days, I went to various discussions together with Generals von Seidlitz, Lapman, Dr. Kors, and von Linsky. I was particularly delighted when I heard that Field Marshal Paulus was on his way from Voikovo to Moscow. Several days later, I visited him, together with von Seidlitz. Our conversation was especially friendly. Paulus was happy to have gotten away from the grumbling atmosphere of Voikovo. The news of the assassination attempt on Hitler had provoked indignation from most of these generals, although some of them had become uncertain. Paulus spoke openly of his sympathy for the National Committee Fries Deutschland and the League of German Officers. When I left him, I was convinced that we could soon reckon on his cooperation. Luniovo had been the seat of the National Committee Fries Deutschland and the League of German Officers for two years now, in my abode and workplace. There I came into close contact with generals and officers whom I already knew. General Walter von Seitlitz, a soldier through and through, who had already come out against Hitler in the cauldron. Major General Darkorfs, an historian who as early as the advance of 1941 had opposed the shootings of hostages and Jews. Major General Martin Labman, a former convinced National Socialist, who now saw Hitler's ideals as derisory and betraying. Major General Arno von Linsky, my closest friend and former cavalry officer. Colonel Leupold Stiedel, the Catholic action supporter and intrepid regimental commander. The engineer majors Karl Hetz and Herbert Stasslein. Major Heinrich Hohmann, son of a Hamburg ship owner. Major Ebert von Frankenberg, a Luftwaffe officer from an old officer family. And Major Hermann Lurens. Secretary of the League of German Officers. Among the other members and colleagues of the National Committee that I got to know were the Corporals or Privates Hans Gosens, Dr. Gunter Kircher, Max Emmendorfer, Heinz Kessler, Reinhold Fleshhut, and Leonard Helmschrett, workers, officials, and farmers in civilian life. 
An important role in the work of the Fries Deutschland movement was played by a group of Wehrmacht pagers, among them the Catholic priests Joseph Kaiser, Peter Moore and Dar Alois Ludwig, as well as the evangelical priests Johannes Schroeder, Nikolai Sinischen, Mathis Klein and Dar Friedrich Wilhelm Krummacher. Dr. Krummacher was a senior consistorial advisor in the Berlin External Office. In the autumn of 1943, he was taken prisoner near Kiev. After the flight of the German troops, a Soviet Union Special State Commission established that during the occupation more than 195,000 innocent Kiev citizens, men, women, children and old folk, had been shot, hanged or poisoned. Dot Kronecker had seen exhumed corpses from these massacres near Babi Yar in a ravine-ridden area on the edge of Kiev. Shattered by the bestial cruelty of this fascism, the evangelical divisional priest Krummacher joined the Fries Deutschland movement. He and 24 other pagers, before they came to Luniovo, had appealed to the Christians at the front, in which they said, Hitler has lit the burning fires of this war with excessive arrogance. He has spread the conquest and rapine of foreign countries with frivolous openness as war aims. For these criminal aims he has let, without any moral rights, but only an extension of his powerful rule, millions of Germans shed their blood at the front and has brought blooming cities back in the homeland with women and children to destruction in the air war. He has shamed the honor of the German name through unprecedented cruelties in the occupied countries by means of bloody terror against other peoples. Over the course of time, I also encountered men who had been threatened with death or internment in concentration camps in Hitler's Germany, but had found asylum in the Soviet Union. There was the president of the National Committee Fries Deutschland and the writer Eric Weinert. Their names I had seen on Leafless, together with those of Walter Olbricht and Willy Bredo, in the cauldron on the Volga. On the 3rd August 1944, I participated in a full session of the National Committee Fries Deutschland. As guests were also invited 16 generals who had shortly before become prisoners of war, including Generals Volkers, Freiherr von Litzow, Vincent Müller, Bamler and Gallwitzer, who they disassociated themselves from Hitler in a proclamation concerning the 22nd July 1944. Action against Hitler is acting for Germany. They called out to the generals and officers on the Eastern Front. President Eric Weinert opened the session. Major General Lapman analyzed the military situation resulting from the defeat of Army Group MIT, which the National Committee had rightly foreseen. The war was approaching Germany's eastern borders with giant steps. The whole German nation was threatened with a Stalingrad if Hitler and his war did not come to an end. The discussion brought all-round supplements to Lapman's presentation, including notebooks and letters found on fallen German soldiers and descriptions from the latest prisoners of war of the effects of the air war on the homeland. Under the massed attacks of British and American bombers, German towns were sinking in rubble and ashes. Already many old folk, women and children lay buried under the wreckage. In a robust voice, General of Infantry Volkers, the eldest ranking officer among the guests, reported on how the German course and divisions had been destroyed in the central section. To the acclaim of those present, Generals Volkers, Gallwitzer, Hofmeister, von Litzo, Muller, Traub, Engel and Klamp announced their joining of the League of German Officers. My heart blood when I heard these reports, but in Vojkovo, a few hundred kilometers away, there were other generals who called these men traitors who had called for the overthrow of the government, but who themselves had inflicted frightful harm on their way and had thrust the people and nation into the abyss. After this session, I had to be alone. I sought out a bench at the far end of the park and went over my thoughts. It pained me to have heard all these things and reinforced me in my decision against Hitler and for a free Germany. In the coming days, I had many talks with the most recently arrived generals. Unfortunately, with some of them, I got the feeling that things had happened too quickly for them. They all complained about Hitler, but hardly any of them said a word about having shortly before been obeying his orders. Hardly any of them said anything about how they thought the new Germany should look. One clear exception was Lieutenant General Vincent Müller. As a Reichswehr officer in General von Schleicher's department, he had already had insight into the policies of the various national and military groups in Germany and also knew details about the preparations for war and the fastest conquest aims. 
Contrary to Hitler's basic prohibition, as deputy commander of the 12th Corps, he had given the order to surrender on the 8th July 1944, thereby saving the lives of thousands of soldiers surrounded east of the Ptich River. Honestly and soberly, Vincent Muller put his own past aside, but did not speak of being free from the corresponsibility for fascism. I also came into conversation with General Hofmeister. By chance, he mentioned that he had reported an event to a chief of engineers who had flown out of the cauldron. Colonel Sell, I asked. Yes, that was his name. In the officer's mess of this former battalion in Hamburg Harbor, he had described before the officers and guessed the criminal flippancy with which the 6th Army had been treated by the high command in its defeat. But somebody must have betrayed him. He was arrested and sent to Spandau. Nothing further is known. I was sorry for Sell, but hats off to him. He had at least tried to call the person responsible by the right name. On the 8th August 1944, the day on which Field Marshal von Witzleben was hanged on the gallows in Berlin on Hitler's orders, Field Marshal Paulus abandoned the reserve that he had imposed on himself for more than a year and a half. That evening he spoke on Sender Free's Deutschland radio. Tensely, we sat in front of the radio in Lunjovo. Then came the well-known voice. Recent events have made the continuation of the war a pointless sacrifice for Germany. The war is lost for Germany. Germany has come to this position through the leadership of the state and war by Adolf Hitler. From this comes the behavior of some of his representatives in the occupied territories who have acted against the inhabitants in a way that is abhorrent to all true soldiers and all true Germans, and must have produced the strongest reproaches from the whole world. If the German people do not dissociate themselves from this behavior, they must bear the full responsibility for it. Germany must rid itself of Adolf Hitler and get a new head of government to end the war and bring about circumstances that will enable our people to go on living and enter into peaceful, yes friendly, relations with our present enemies. On the 14th August 1944 Paulus announced his membership of the League of German Officers. A few days later, on the 22nd August, he added his signature at the full assembly of the National Committee Fries Deutschland. At this meeting, General von Seidlitz reported on the work of the National Committee over the previous year. The multitude of tasks surprised me. Front line addresses by loudspeaker, leafless and personal letters to the German commanders, discussions with prisoners of war immediately behind the front line, advertising and explaining in all prisoner of war camps, distribution of the Fries Deutschland newspaper and an illustrated magazine. Radio programs broadcast from Moscow and often carried by various European stations. The military situation in Germany was approaching complete chaos. Only the day before, Romania had abandoned the war. The Balkan front had collapsed. The German troops in Greece and Crete were cut off. The Red Army was deep inside Hungary. Army Group South Ukraine was defeated. Army Group North surrounded with 350,000 men. In the West, the Allies, following their landing in northern France in June 1944, were advancing. Germany's home territory would become a battlefield in the immediate future. The National Committee, which wanted to hinder this development with all its might, declared once more that only a combined fight by the army and the people could alleviate the catastrophe. With this in mind, the National Committee decided at the 13th Full Assembly, at which Walter Ulbricht, speaking especially on the role of the Wehrmacht in the new phase of fighting, called for all weapons against Hitler. This was, in effect, a renewed demand to form a National People's Front. The same theme came through two months later at the 14th Full Assembly, which centered on a report by Lieutenant General Vincent Muller, Volkssturm, the ultimate futility of Hitler's bankruptcy. I too had begun working, writing for the Fries Deutschland newspaper and discussing various problems on the radio, because of my inclinations and knowledge, I went on working with the cultural group of the National Committee, in which, among other questions, the cultural organization of Germany was discussed and clarified. There were similar working groups for the economy, law, and social policies. Above all, however, I learned and studied by myself. Every week there was a day of recitals and discussions. German politicians, trade unionists, writers, Soviet university lecturers, Professors and officers offered a copious program. In Luniovo, I had oversight of all the National Committee's activities, 
as well as the organizational and educational work in the prisoner of war camps. There were representatives of the National Committee everywhere. From time to time delegations left Lunyovo for several days to assist and instruct in the camps. But no less important right until the end of war was the work of the National Committee at the front. In every sector of the Red Army front there was an authorized organizer. At his disposal were prisoner of war soldiers and officers available at the Army and Divisional Headquarters. They worked on the front line with the spoken and written word, predominantly with leaflets. There were some that explained the aims of the National Committee and called for men to cross over in large numbers. There were others that revealed the nature of the war and the Hitler government that described Soviet captivity and finally, in view of the local situation, the purposelessness of resistance. Also, personal letters sent back by captured generals or commanders played a certain role. A similarly important and effective means was the loudspeaker, in varying strengths and range. The transmissions had a similar effect to the leaflets, taking into consideration the immediate front activity. Ever more often individual prisoners of war were sent back. Above all, they demonstrated what Soviet captivity entailed and disproved Goebbels' propaganda. Most of them had the task of forming Wehrmacht groups of the National Committee and of leading them to the front commanders at a set time. The movement's authorities valued the results of these activities highly, conducted talks with new prisoners of war and explained to them at the collecting camps about captivity and the war situation. They carried out all of the work in their front sector and prepared the commission pamphlets, radio texts, and information. Lastly, they maintained liaison with the National Committee in Lumyovo. Several times in special circumstances, the National Committee and the Presidium of the League of German Officers sent delegations of their leading members to the front. Thus, at the beginning of February 1944, General von Seidlitz, accompanied by Major General Dark Korfs, Major Lurens and Captain Dart Hatterman went to the Korsen Shevchenkovsky cauldron to support the task of the National Committee's working group under Colonel Steedle and 2nd Lieutenant von K. Gelgen. Here some 75,000 German soldiers were surrounded and faced certain destruction if they did not surrender at the right time. The generals and officers of the former 6th Army talked to General Stemmerman, the commander of the surrounded troops, whose situation was becoming ever more similar to that of Paulus at Stalingrad. In the cauldron itself, meanwhile, SS General Gill had grabbed command for himself. He ordered a senseless outbreak, from which only a few thousand got through. Another 55,000 German soldiers and officers remained dead on the battlefield, and 18,000 surrendered, of whom the majority immediately joined the German freedom movement. The Battle of Korsen Shevchenkovsky played an important role in the further work of the National Committee and the League of German Officers. It showed that Hitler's order, We Never Surrender, from the Commander-in-Chief of the Wehrmacht, was still being maintained. The sober General Stimmerman was detained by SS General Gill. He confirmed what the National Committee had already established at its sixth session in January 1944 that a retreat to the right boundaries under the command of its generals could not be relied on. In the last phase of the Cauldron Battle of korsen Shevchenkovsky, the new password, suspend the fighting and cross over to the side of the National Committee, Freeze Deutschland, was used for the first time. Many prisoner of war statements confirmed that the existence of the National Committee and the League of German officers was known to almost all the members of the Wehrmacht on the Eastern Front. Radio Freeze Deutschland was heard by many at home and at the front. A special stimulus to this was the broadcasting of names and greetings by members of the Wehrmacht who were now prisoners of war. It was especially important that people in the front line and in the homeland were aware that many thousands of German prisoners were alive. This knowledge alone saved the lives of tens of thousands who, without it, would have committed suicide in hopeless situations. In the autumn of 1944, East Prussia became a battlefield. In the West also, the front line was already being pushed back onto German soil. It was so to speak the last but one minute before the land war covered the whole of Germany. At this point, 50 prisoner of war German generals assembled in Osiro, a country house near Moscow and Paulus former place of detention. Walter Olbrich spoke on behalf of the National Committee about the military situation. I had a comfortable place and was able to observe the attentive audience well. How the times had changed, I thought to myself. 
When had a Prussian German general ever thought that the leading communists would conduct the future direction of the war much more competently than all the German generals put together? This man had warned us already two years ago. Enemy propaganda, we call it then. But how right he had been. Some of the generals had prepared an appeal to the people and the Wehrmacht. Several present based their agreement on personal experiences and assessments. There were several small amendments. Then General von Seidlitz was able to confirm unanimous agreement. Field Marshal Paulus was the first to sign, followed by the other 49 generals. In January 1945, the Red Army launched the Vistula Offensive, the last of the Second World War. A few months later, the Battle of Berlin came to an end and the Soviet Army hoisted a victory flag over the Reichstag. The Wehrmacht High Command surrendered unconditionally on the 8th May 1945 to the Soviet Union and its Western allies. Hitler and his propaganda chief Goebbels committed suicide. A few weeks before we heard of an event that appalled both me and many of my Lunyovo comrades, the beautiful city of Dresden, with its irreplaceable historical buildings, crumpled into dust and ashes on the night of 13th-14th February 1945. 10,000 people of all ages lay buried under the rubble. Anglo-American bombers had been responsible for this act of barbaric destruction. In no way was it a military necessity to turn this open city on the Elbe into a sea of flames. The war was already militarily decided. Soviet forces were approaching the city from the east. No Soviet aircraft had dropped a single bomb on the city. Swiss newspapers said that the British and Americans had wanted to prevent Dresden falling intact into the Red Army's hands. We in Ludiovo came to the same conclusion. The Elbe city was an important communications junction. Apparently, the Western powers wanted to slow down the Soviet advance into the heart of Germany. The terror attack on Dresden was another link in the chain of hostile acts by the imperialist circles in England and America against their Soviet allies who above all had already witnessed the long delays visible on the second front in the West. Here lay the kernel of a policy of the Western powers against their socialist allies, which in the post-war years proved to be the seeds of the Cold War. The last months of the war were for me and my comrades especially difficult to bear. My heart blood when I heard the daily reports from the front describing how the war was destroying and annihilating as it bit deeper into Germany. In Hitler's Volksturm, children and old men were being driven into the slaughter. And above all, there were no generals who had even the remnants of a sense of responsibility. And even now, long past the point of no return, they ordered the Wehrmacht's senseless resistance to continue. The finale in Germany echoed what had happened to the German army on the Volga, but on a worse scale. The human victims and losses of material that this demanded exceeded my worst fears. The National Committee Freies Deutschland and the League of German Officers had unfortunately been right in calling on the people and the Wehrmacht for almost two years to put an end to Hitler and the war, or there would be the worst catastrophe in German history. But back to Luniovo in the spring of 1945. In me the knowledge ripened that a free, better journey must be renewed from the ground up. Neither the gun manufacturing magnates nor Hitler's generals had stood up to the test of history. Liebknecht, Thaumann, Peek, Ulbricht, and their comrades had all opposed the war. Their class, the working class, which already for decades had been responsible for the greatest creation of national wealth, must now also become the politically leading class, the ruling class in Germany. Only this way could peace in Germany find a secure home. In the Fries Deutschland movement, we had learnt that the leader of the workers' movement had begun honestly combining the peasantry the managers and other workers. We too, the officers and generals of Hitler's army, had been sincerely offered a hand in this joint national movement. The Allies' Postum Agreement confirmed the National Committee's thinking about the new Germany. Fascism and militarism were to be torn out by the roots, the economic and financial monopoly smashed, the whole of Germany democratically remodeled. It was not easy for me and most of my comrades to accept the eastern boundaries established by the conquerors. There were many difficult discussions about this, but I already knew the previous history and course of the war in Poland. The pincers formed by East Prussia and Silesia had twice been used by German militarism to attack Poland. Over six million Poles were destroyed and murdered in the Second World War. 
As bitter as it was, Germany had to accept the consequences of Hitler's war crimes. The security claims of Poland and the Soviet Union were justified. Not all the generals and officers who had signed the proclamations against Hitler in the previous weeks wanted to accept the reality of German responsibility for the war. Several crumbled away in the following period. They broke away from the Fries Deutschland movement and returned to the font of the incurable. A little time later, I encountered many hate-filled looks from such people in Volkovo. Even during the last days of the war, a number of leading communists, headed by Walter Ulbricht, departed to work in Germany. Throughout the summer, several groups of anti-fascists, among them soldiers and officers, were flown in from the Red Army's occupied zone so that they could take part in the building of a new Germany. But the return was not so quick for everyone. Some members of the National Committee allowed themselves to be carried away by the reproaches of the German immigrants against the Soviet Union. The effect of the whole atmosphere did not change the course of things. The last complete session of the National Committee Fries Deutschland took place on the 2nd November 1945. Erich Weiner drew up a detailed statement. After the work at the front, he praised above all the contribution of the re-education of the prisoners of war, which was especially valuable for the democratizing of large sections of the German people. The basic elements of the National Committee now lived on in Germany in the bloc of democratic parties. In the homeland, the bloc had taken over the immediate guidance of the political, economic, and social organizations. Thus, the existence of the National Committee outside Germany had become superfluous. At the conclusion of the session, Weinert suggested the disbandment of the National Committee Fries Deutschland. General von Seidlitz submitted an appropriate proposal for the League of German Officers. The radio and newspaper Fries Deutschland also ceased their activities. On the 18th October 1945, the opening session of the International Military Court was held in Berlin for the acceptance of witness statements against the main war criminals. This gave us plenty to talk about. I felt great satisfaction that Hitler's closest accomplices, Goring, Keitel, Jovel, Raider, Donitz, Rosenberg, Ribbentrop, and others, should have to atone for the crimes against peace and mankind for which they were substantially to blame. Pravda and Izvestia brought out daily reports on the course of the process, which contained so many infamous details that I as a German sometimes felt quite mortified. This I had also participated in for years, contributing my whole strength into it to support goals that were thoroughly anti-human and criminal. Paulus had been working very intensely. I knew that this was connected with the process, but I was not a little astounded when I heard on the radio that he would appear at Nuremberg as a witness against the war criminals. In the many hours in which, bound by Hitler's order, he had decided to hold on in the cauldron on the Volga, he had let fall from time to time a bitter word about the whole war. Now, however, in his statement at Nuremberg, he produced a clear condemnation of the war. Without holding back, he went through the previous history of the war since the autumn of 1940 exploring Hitler Germany's systematic preparations for a war of conquest against the Soviet Union. Here are some extracts from his interview with the Soviet main prosecutor, General Rudenko. He said, Under what conditions was the armed assault conducted on the Soviet Union that had been prepared by the Hitler regime and by the Wehrmacht High Command? Paulus. The attack on the Soviet Union proceeded, as I have explained, according to a long prepared and careful plan. The attacking troops were first established in depth in the concentration areas. They were at first, according to special instructions, ordered forwards by sectors into the starting positions and then moved off along the whole front from Romania to East Prussia. Apart from this, the Finnish war was underway at the same time. A great deceptive undertaking organized from Norway to the French coast was planned to suggest the intention of a landing in England in June 1941, and with it distract attention from the east, but not only for the operational, but especially for the tactical surprise, all requirements were met. For example, the forbidding of all visible reconnaissance over the border before the war began. This implied on one hand that we would have to bear losses that could arise through the sacrifice of reconnaissance in the interest of surprise. But on the other hand, it meant also that the enemy would not fear an attack over the border. All these measures show it concerned a criminal assault here. General Rudenko, 
who among the accused was an active participant in the development of the war of attack on the Soviet Union. Paulus, of the accused, as far as those I can see, Hitler's first military advisors, that is, the chief of the Wehrmacht High Command, Keitel, the chief of the Wehrmacht Command Office, Joe, and Goering in his capacity as commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, and as the head of the armaments industry. I heard that Paulus had also spent several days in Dresden. I would have loved to hear how it looked, and the other German cities, from his own personal experience. But I did not meet up with him as he had gone to new accommodation in the Soviet Union since his return. Instead of this meeting with Paulus, I experienced something quite different. In March or April 1946, I was summoned by the commandant of our camp. How is your family, Colonel Adam? He asked, once I had sat down. What sort of a question is that, I thought, when he knows that I have had no news from home? Not exactly friendly, I replied. How would I know? I have received no post so far. With a gentle smile, he took hold of a file and pulled out a postcard. Is this perhaps addressed to you? I grabbed it hastily. My heart threatened to burst as I recognized my wife's handwriting. Then I had to smile. The card was addressed simply to Colonel Adam Stalingrad. Now you can see how diligent our post is, said the commandant. Now send your correct address home. Your wife and daughter will be waiting anxiously for a sign of life from you. And my congratulations on this first news. He gave me a plain postcard from a stack and I left beaming. I now knew that my wife and daughter had survived the war. In the middle of May 1946, Lunyovo was cleared. Already during the previous months, many members and associates of the National Committee and the League of German officers had gone back home or moved to other camps. With a group that contained among others Generals von Seitlitz, von Linsky and Dark Korfs, Majors Homan and von Frankenberg, I went to the General's camp at Voikovo. The camp's commandant, political officer and interpreter greeted us warmly as old acquaintances. Less friendly was our reception by the German general prisoners of war. Most of them I hardly knew personally at all and many of them I had never even heard of. But even the former generals of the 6th Army with whom I had lived for over a year in 1943-44 were afraid of talking to me. The only one to greet me as an old friend was General Wolves. I was allocated a room already occupied by an admiral, two generals, and a labor corps major. These gentlemen would have preferred to show me the door. Only reluctantly did they clear a space for me. Their main preoccupation was playing cars and their main conversational topics were the grand old times, the rank lists and their experiences in officers' messes. They had little interest in the copious library, much more in the food. It is not easy for these groups of poorly spirited, defeated lords of the battlefield to find the right words. Ebert von Frankenberg, who experienced this time in Voikovo with me, has written in his book, Mine in Scheida, My Decision of his successful attempt to present some of these heroes in all their stupidity, arrogance, and at the same time, political menace. Several days after our arrival, a room became available that I moved into together with Von Linsky, Dark Horse, Von Frankenberg, Homan, and other comrades. I was happy not to have to listen to the brainless nonsensical reminiscing of my former roommates. At about the same time, there were several moves going on within the camp. Soldiers of the support company, German, Romanian, Italian, and Hungarian, moved furniture and mattresses about. New beds and wardrobes were set up. Everything indicated that the camp was expecting new arrivals. One day it happened. The camp gate opened and streamed some generals heavily laden with suitcases, blankets, and many other things that we could barely remember. They were mainly the generals who had been captured in Curland but also others who until then had been accommodated in Krasnogorsk or Sustel. Many of them I knew. We watched their noisy arrival out of our windows. The camp road was overfilled in no time. Calls were exchanged between the newcomers and the old hands. Then the stream gradually eased off as the new arrivals occupied their allocated rooms. In leaving the building, I met two generals whom I knew from the war school in Dresden. Surprise, they shook my hand warmly. Had these gentlemen drawn similar consequences from their experiences as I had? But this supposition turned out to be an error. They believed that they would only meet those of a similar disposition in the general's camp. The old ones soon briefed them. Several hours later, 
When I came across one of the two generals on the camp street, he turned around and went off. In the camp, there were now about 170 German, 36 Hungarian, 6 Romanian, and 3 Italian generals. They were guided by the holding out strategies of Forch, Wuthman, Specht, Hacks, and Marx. Whoever strayed from the dictated line was tyrannized. In the ranks of the eternally written off were most of those generals who, back in December, had been among the 50 who had signed the appeal together with Paulus and Saitlitz. In a kind of honorary legal proceedings conducted by the reactionary group these gentlemen had to confess. They used lies and defamation to justify the steps they had taken at the time and maintained that they had signed under pressure. Once they had disassociated themselves from the League of German officers, they were taken honorably back into the community of Hitler's most loyal officers. The whole episode left me speechless. These people were like chameleons. No wonder the soldiers of the support company made no secret of their contempt for this kind of general. But there were also some with sufficient spiritual independence not to let themselves be cowed. Among them was General Dar Altrichter. Equally friendly, he returned my greeting without reacting to the angry looks of the others. He told me that his son, who was a year younger than my Heinz and had attended the same school in Dresden, had fallen as a young soldier. Like Paulus, Altrichter was an educated type. Among the generals he was regarded as an odd fellow, as he avoided their company, their superficial conversation and their card games. Mainly he sat alone on a remote bench in the beautiful park, reading or writing about religious matters. It was maliciously said that he wanted to found a new religious community, but as he was not brought up spiritually, he sought to set himself apart in the eyes of the others. In fact, General Altrichter rejected their narrow-minded snobbery and their military inflexibility, even if he did not join the declared anti-fascists. We had very close connections with the Romanian generals. They came to our room, went out with us for walks, and always greeted us in a friendly manner. They hated Hitler and his clique, who had brought so much trouble and distress. We talked for hours in German or French about the future tasks of our people. The three Italian generals were dedicated fascists and stayed close to the reactionary group of German generals. The Hungarian generals held themselves back at first. They played no part with the fanatical cranks among the German generals and seemed, despite various developments, indifferent. In the course of time, we nevertheless noticed that there were some cracks in the Hungarian generals' united front. Almost all of them hated Hitler's Germany, and some had drawn similar conclusions from their experiences about the new reorganization of their homeland. That is something like the picture I drew in the first weeks of my second stay in Vorkovo. Despite the social prescribing that the majority of Hitler's devoted henchmen sought to hang over us, we made contact with two young generals, Gies and Newman, they also moved into our room. The weeks and months I spent in Vojkovo from 1946 to 1947 were not useless for me. I turned my studies to many fields, including politics, science, and literature, increased my knowledge of the Russian language and worked on my hobby, mathematics. I attentively read the German newspapers, which reached us somewhat late, but apparently without gaps. Shortly before I had left Lunyovo came the news of the unification of the two German workers' parties as the Socialist United German Party, Sozialistischen Einheitsparty Deutschlands. My friends and I took this event to be of great historical significance, for it was clear to us that without firm leadership by a united, purposeful workers' party, a basically renewed Germany could not be achieved. We were proud that the way of the community of all democratic and constructive forces that had been combined in the Fries Deutschland movement had been initiated and was now established in East Germany. The daily contact with the strategies of imperialism and militarism in the Vojkovo camp was a good school for us in our later political work. The convulsive troubles of this clique to preserve its self-containment, the prevention of individuals stepping out of line, showed its weakness. News from Germany that involved critical thoughts was simply dismissed as untrue. A stubborn rejection of all new things was the general line of these gentlemen. Should one dare to dance out of line, he was brought back to common sense with the threat of a court of honor. The leaders of the reaction were some of the former general staff officers. At their head stood General Forch, chief of the general staff of Army Group Curland. Not an awkward man, he knew how to tread carefully and to reveal little. 
Nevertheless, we discover on various occasions that he really was a wire puller. With the Americans against the Russians was his motto. Now and then we heard from this or that general that he nevertheless looked anxious before he started even a short conversation. To the fort staff belonged General Mihoff, commandant of Breslau, General Wuthman, commandant of the German troops on Bornholm, General Hermann, a young Luftwaffe commodore, and General Marx, chief of staff of Army Group Kurland. For a long time we had been aware that certain generals were meeting regularly at a particular place in the park. From a distance one could see them discussing and writing. By accident it happened that one day the second lieutenants von Einsiedel and von Putkamer, who had come from Lunovo with us, were witness to a spiritedly presented speech. It was hard to believe what was reported to us. The defeated generals had analyzed the Eastern campaign in their own way, drawing conclusions for the structure and arming of the German army after the conclusion of peace agreements, and they noted quite carefully what could be done better in the future. Weeks later, at about two o'clock in the morning, I was awoken by loud voices. In the room stood a Soviet officer with two soldiers. Control, he said. There was lively activity everywhere. The windows were also lit in the building opposite mine. Awkwardly enough, baggage, beds, and clothing were checked. Nothing escaped the searching eyes. Boxes full of material, mainly written pieces, letters, and books, went to the headquarters. A cannonade of protests came from the generals. Soon afterwards, some of the seized items were returned, but suspicious materials, including the general's war interpretation, found their way into the files of the Soviet authorities. We heard that blacklists had also been found with our names on them. What this meant, whispered General Nihoff to me when we met in the Linden Alley, is that you rascals will be the first we hang when we go home. Poor wretch, I thought. Nihoff was not only a fully hard-boiled reactionary, but also a common pig, who used filthy language and told dirty stories such as I had never heard from anyone before. With this chest full of high decorations, he strutted through the camp and trumpeted his smutty jokes loudly so that nobody could fail to hear them. Apparently, he believed he could impress people that way. One day, however, he and his kind had the wind knocked out of their sails. It was the end of 1946 when the camp commandant, on the basis of a four-power decision, had all decorations and badges of rank confiscated. This also applied to the general's red gold insignia and all the silver tinsel. Without them, the uniforms really looked stained and faded. The truth of the words clothing makes men could seldom have been clearer than in this example. During the course of the summer, members of the support company erected a small log hut behind the kitchen building under the direction of a Soviet specialist. It consisted of three rooms that could be heated by a single stove. Once the hut was ready, the camp commandant said that we could move inside. This we naturally did, and gladly. The big room accommodated General von Seidlitz the painter Lieutenant Colonel Professor Kaiser and myself, while the smaller of the rooms was occupied by Generals Von Linsky and Darikorfs. In the front room lived the two prisoner of war soldiers who had been allocated to us. The hut became the center of our group, but it did not remain all that long in the old form. In the spring of 1947, Von Linsky was moved to Paulus at Termolino near Moscow and General Buschenhagen moved in with us. Previously, he had been with Paulus, together with Vincent Muller and Dar General Professor Dar Schreiber. To the annoyance of the Guard of Generals, Buschenhagen reported how generously he had been treated by the Soviet citizens. Several times he had visited Moscow with its many places of interest. He was full of praise for the museums and galleries, the wonderful underground railway and the resilience with which the Soviet people went about overcoming the difficulties caused by the war. Months later, on a hot day in July, I was standing at the workbench I had made for myself behind the hut, dressed only in my sports clothing, working on a wooden suitcase. A surgeon came up to me, smiling broadly, and called out to the camp commandant immediately. I must change my clothes. I cannot appear in front of the camp commandant like this. But quickly, comrade colonel. A few minutes later, I stood in front of the camp commandant. Good day, comrade colonel, he greeted me. I have been tasked with informing you that you will be leaving our camp today. Pack your things in peace and say goodbye to your comrades. At 6 p.m., the evening meal will be ready for you in the kitchen. Then return here at 7 p.m. 
Can you tell me where I am going? The camp commandant smiled. I cannot tell you that, but it is in a westerly direction. I wish you all the best for the future. Have a good journey. I had never moved through the camp so quickly. On the way I encountered General Wolves. I am going away, father. I called out to him. Where to? He asked. In a westerly direction. More I do not know. At 7 p.m., I am off to Ivanovo. The news of my departure spread quickly through the whole camp. Even generals who otherwise avoided our log hut were curious. My things were soon packed, and I was able to say farewell to my comrades with whom I had a firm friendship. That was not easy, but we were convinced that in any case, we would all see each other again in Germany and that the work we had begun here would be continued. I was accompanied by a major and the interpreter Lebedev to Ivanovo, where we climbed into the night train for Moscow. For a long time I gazed through the compartment window and thought about Germany, my homeland. In Mecklenburg, Brandenburg, Saxony and Hull, Thuringian and Saxony were stationed units of the Red Army, while in the West sat the British, French and Americans. My wife lived with our daughter in an old house in Munzenburg, not far from Bad Nauheim in Hessen. That was in the American occupation zone. If anyone had asked me, where do you want to go? Where would you like to work in future? I would have replied without hesitation from earnest conviction. Where the new Germany is being built, there will I put my whole strength for disposal. But will my wife and daughter follow me? The train rolled into the Kassaner station. We were in Moscow. A Soviet lieutenant was waiting for me. After a hearty farewell from my escort, I went with the lieutenant to a car parked in front of the station. Where are we going? I asked. He smiled. You will see. Once we had left the city behind us, I recognized from previous experience that this was not the way to Krasnogorsk, perhaps to Termolino. I puzzled about a remembered description by General Bushenhagen. Then there must soon be an airfield on the right side of the road. In fact, there it was already. The aircraft were standing there in rows. In the middle of the woods, we came across an extended settlement of small and large wooden houses, single and double story, with stone built buildings in between, shaded by trees and surrounded by gardens. This was a so called Dachin town, where the houses were usually only occupied in the summer months. Behind a tall wire fence was our goal a charming country house with a glazed in veranda and a terrace that extended deep into the garden. While I was being greeted by a major, my friend Arno von Linsky also arrived around the corner. From him, I learned that Paulus Muller and Professor Dar Schreiber were not present at the moment, but were expected soon. Arno von Linsky told me further that I would be making a long journey with him to the Volga. What will we do there? The population are not very friendly towards officers of the 6th Army. Linsky was holding the book with the title, The Stalingrad Battle. This is a screenplay by the Soviet author Verga. The direction emphasizes that in the film the German side is not falsely nor distortedly shown. I have already had a look at it. Tomorrow we will go through it together. We will be in Stalingrad for the exterior shots. The interior scenes are being filmed in Moscow. Indeed, that is interesting. And when does it start? I asked. At the latest in a week. A few days later we were sitting in a fast train to Stalingrad. As we approached our destination, the former battlefield extended to the left and right of the railway line. It still had not been possible to remove all the rubble, mountains of iron and steel, smashed vehicles, burnt out tanks and exploded gun barrels recalled the fury of the fighting here. There were lots of new buildings in Gumrak, and the airfield was in use. The city had bled from a thousand wounds, but new life was already growing. The horrible past grew perilously high within me. I saw the tens of thousands of wounded, sick, and half-starved troops of the German 6th Army, the piles of stacked frozen corpses that the iron-hard earth refused to accept. I recalled the terrible days and nights between hope and destruction, the last hours of the frightful finale, but that was not quite the last of it. It was quite different from five years before when I acknowledged the great blame that we Germans heaped upon ourselves when we broke through the border, killing and destroying in Soviet land. In the face of the city on the Volga arising anew, I swore once more to use all my strength to ensure that eternal friendship would reign between the German and Soviet peoples. In the following days we had the opportunity now and then to look around the city and the neighborhood. In the big factories in the north, 
especially the tractor factory, production was in full swing. The main road had been rebuilt south of the Zaritza, and on the river bank rose a white theater. The trams were running. Cinemas, libraries, schools, and hospitals had opened their doors. Everywhere ruins were being blown up. The rubble cleared away to make way for new housing blocks. Lenski and I wanted to see a lot and speak to people. There was an opportunity to do this during our extensive walks that we made in the afternoons with our attendant and an interpreter. We were particularly interested in the area in which the Soviet 62nd Army under General Chuka had fought so hard and bitterly. One small incident showed that the spirit of these fighters remained alive. On the high bank of the Volga, not far from the bombed and burnt out oil tanks, we met a man at work with a spade. He recognized us as former German officers and spoke to us. It transpired that he had been a senior officer in the big battle. Are you a Stalingrader? I asked him. No, neither my wife nor I were born in Stalingrad. But when the war came to an end, we decided to live and work in this historical city, said the colonel, who had eventually commanded a division decisively. So, do you already live here? Yes, he said, over there. He pointed at a room and that was once a house. You can see what remains of it. We lived like that often during the war. My wife and I have set up makeshift accommodation for us there. And here we are building a new little house from the material lying around. Here, that is the ground plan. He drew the tracing of a rectangle on the size of which he had raised the ground for the walls and continued, should you come back in a few years, you will not see any more of the consequences of the war. Probably I will then be living in a modern house with many stories. One time a cross-country vehicle took us to the Mamai Kurgan, the dominating hill on which so much blood had flowed. Now though the ground looked plowed over, shell crater next to shell crater, and masses of blown up shells, cartridge cases, machine gun belts, bits of weapons, and even human bones. One day we stood in front of the rebuilt department store, at the place where my way into captivity had begun. A bronze tablet next to the entrance recorded that on the 31st January 1943 in the cellars of this building the headquarters staff of the German 6th Army under Field Marshal Paulus had been taken prisoner. Part of the filming, about which von Linsky and I would advise, was to take place on the open square before the department store. Late one afternoon, in the presence of some senior Soviet officers, a German tank attack took place. Tanks bearing the Balkan crews rolled over the rubble, Flames shot out of empty window holes in the ruins. Infantry with machine pistols and hand grenades attacked with a loud hurrah. Captured German officers and soldiers had been especially newly provided with uniforms for this purpose. Understandably, thousands of civilians could not miss watching this display when the rumor went round that Paulus himself would be taking part. The scenes must have aroused some bitter memories among these people but there was no word of disgust about the German staff officers present. At the end of September, our filming mission came to an end. We made the return journey via Moscow to Termolino, where we met Paulus and Vincent Muller. They were as happy about our reunion as we were. The accounts from both sides went on all day long. Several times, accompanied by the camp commandant, I drove with Arno von Linsky in Moscow to get to know people, the city, and museums. Suddenly winter was upon us, the seventh that I had experienced in the Soviet Union. Christmas was drawing near. It always brought a certain melancholy with it. On the other hand, I became involved at this time with the preparation of small gifts that were cut, painted, or written. For me, it was a special task. On the whole, every day of captivity involved various activities. Studying, reading, shoveling snow, walking, chatting. In the many weeks of captivity, I had learned that this was better born when existence was governed by a set plan. So every day I sought to live a kind of hourly program. This saved much useless brooding, shortened the time and helped me above all to extend my knowledge systematically. On the 28th March 1948, I celebrated my 55th birthday. Three days later we were visited by the head of prisoner of war affairs from Moscow. He invited us all to the lounge. This must mean something important. With a grin, the Soviet general began his performance. Actually, I was coming tomorrow, the 1st April, but I had heard that this day is not quite taken seriously by the Germans. 
So, to avoid the suspicion of an April jest, I have come here today. After a few seconds he went on, turning to Paulus. Generals Muller and Linsky, General Dar Professor Schreiber and Colonel Adam will be released tomorrow and will soon return to Germany. You Field Marshal must have a little patience. We will bring other generals to you to keep you company. The vehicle that will take these gentlemen away will bring the new generals with it. I need not say anything about the joy that overcame the four of us. It was difficult for Paulus, but he did not lose his composure for a moment. He even congratulated us with a gentle smile. Once the Soviet general had left, I went to my room as if in a dream. Now the yearn for day of going home was tangibly near. For a long time I had realized that captivity offered me a unique opportunity to learn and study, and I had used it with all my might. But Germany remained the homeland to which I felt bound by innumerable threads. Sunk in my thoughts, I went over to the window. There I saw Paulus alone out in the garden. He was walking up and down the main path as if in a dream. I hurried to him. Visibly pleased by my appearance, he said, It is difficult for me, Adam, having to remain alone, but it is quite right this way. It would be incomprehensible if an army commander-in-chief went back as long as so many prisoners of war are having to work on the reconstruction of the Soviet Union. Naturally, it would be easier for me if you could all remain with me, but that would not be right. You are more urgently needed in Germany. You can be assured, Field Marshal, that the parting from you comes hard. We will not forget you. Where will you take up your work? Your family is living in the West. Certainly, but I have already informed my wife that I will be remaining in the East. You are right. I'd assume that Miller has made the same decision. But now you must go and pack, or you will not be ready for early tomorrow morning. I am going to stay in the garden. 1st April 1948. At last the vehicle arrived. The time for our farewells had come. Another firm handshake with Paulus. Till we meet again in Germany, the vehicle rolled out of the gate. From Termolino, the journey went straight through Moscow and past the White Russian station. Was this not the road to Krasnogorsk? Yes, it was. In the camp that was so well known to us, we met many of our friends from the National Committee again. They had been brought there from Sustel and Voikovo. We would all be making the journey home together. Before that, we still had the opportunity to take part on a course organized by the Anti-Fascist School 27. At the center point of the teaching plan stood questions on history, Marxist-Leninist philosophy and political economy, as well as the democratic new organization of Germany. For me, this was a worthwhile deepening and rounding off of my knowledge that I had predominantly acquired by self-study. Added to this were excursions to Moscow, to the Museum of the Revolution, to the Tridyakov Gallery, to the theater, and to Gorky Park. Unfortunately, at the end of April, a painful inflammation of the nerves in my left arm obliged me to give up the course and go into hospital. I was kept in for weeks. Specialist in Krasnogorsk and one of the Moscow polyclinics tended to me. I remember with gratitude the senior lady doctor from Krasnogorsk, Magnitova, who gave her first name. She not only looked after my health carefully, she also gave me courage and confidence whenever I expressed doubts whether I would be fit enough for the journey home. Keep calm, she said. You will not miss the transport, especially since the little grandchild is waiting for his grandpa. This lady doctor had done a lot of good for the German prisoners of war. She was generally revered as the Angel of Krasnogorsk. She saw to it that I received special treatment from the Moscow doctors. It worked, and by the end of June I was able to be released as cured and to return to my comrades in the barracks. During my stay in the hospital, I had seen among the German newspapers that I was given to read an occasional copy of the National Zeitung. In a June number was the news that two new political parties had been founded in the Soviet zone, the Democratic Farmers Party of Germany and the National Democratic German Party. Today, writing more than 15 years later, I can still recall the content and language of the program explanations of the National Democratic Party. On the 10th September, the vehicles were ready to take us to the Belarusian station in Moscow. Happily, we shook the hands of the Soviet officers and soldiers. Even Magnitova, so highly esteemed with her snow-white hair, appeared to wish us a happy return home. The train went too slowly, it seemed to creep over the tracks. 
At last we reached Brestley Toss, and after seemingly endlessly appearing days we finally crossed over the Oder Bridge at Frankfurt and Der Oder. We were back in Germany. It was a newly arisen Germany that I was entering after six years of absence, and I, the former colonel and bearer of the Knight's Cross, who had once fallen on other countries with Hitler's army, had become a new person, a determined fighter for peace. While I was still a prisoner of war, the thoughts had ripened within me about starting in with the place where I had belonged in 1939, Dresden. Often I had pictured the world-famous silhouette of the Elbe City with Jord Barr's powerful dome, the slender bell tower of Chiavri's court church, and the needle-pointed castle tower. What could have remained of them after the bombing in February 1945? How were the Swinger, the Opera, the Brulsch Terrace, the Japanese Palace and all the many other architectural jewels that I loved so much? I was close to tears when I saw the rubble. It was just like the ruined city on the Volga in 1942-43. Could I ever be happy again in this desolation? I could, almost unnoticeably, but nevertheless decisively, New life was thrusting its way through the rubble, at first very slowly, but constantly gaining ground. The rebuilt theater had already celebrated its opening. Dresden was the most important place in my work for a new Germany. First of all, I applied for a position in the Saxon Ministry of Education. At the same time, I pressed through what I had learned through the National Committee Fries Deutschland to become involved in immediate political work. I connected with the National Democratic German Party, whose newspaper, National Zeitung, I had already taken note of during my captivity. In the autumn of 1949, I became chairman of the NDGP Saxon Federation. I could already demonstrate in my political work that I had become a conscientious citizen of our German Democratic Republic. I grew in confidence, and with the confidence came ever larger tasks. As a consequence of the elections in the autumn of 1950, I became a member of the East German Parliament and Minister of Finance in the Saxon County government. The transition of the German Democratic Republic into the socialist stage of its development demanded a basic reconstruction of the structure and the working system of the state organs. In the course of these changes, the former division into counties went and with it also my function as Minister of a County Government. Then came a new, larger proof of confidence the call to Berlin to the staff of the People's Barak Police in August 1952, with which I was involved for one and a quarter years. At the beginning of October 1953, my superior, Minister of the Interior Willy Stop, said in passing, Paulus is coming back in a few days' time. He's going to live in Dresden. At the same time, I must ask the question whether you are prepared to take over the Officers' Academy in Dresden. The Academy for Officers of the Barak Police and in my beloved Dresden where Paulus would be living in the future. It could not have been better. I agreed immediately. I also remained in this function when, after the formation of the National People's Army in January 1956, the Dresden Training Establishment became the Academy for Officers of the National People's Army. A high point in the work and life of the Academy was the first big parade on Marx Engels Platz in Berlin on International Workers' Fighting Day the 1st May 1956. On that sunny morning, I had the high honor of leading our officers and officer cadets past the highest representatives of the new Germany, hundreds of distinguished anti-fascist resistance fighters and many foreign delegations. Upon the conclusion of my 65th year on the 31st March 1958, I retired from active service in the National People's Army. A lot of nonsense was written about Paulus' return in the West German newspapers. He arrived at the Ostbahnhof station in Berlin on the Blue Express, accompanied by several enigmatic commissars. He had a mysterious task from Stalin, carrying with him a manuscript that declared the invincibility of the Soviet Union in deterring the aggressive intentions of the Western powers. Not all of the nonsense was true. Paulus came simply as a returnee, upon whom Germany's catastrophic war had been a heavy burden. He came as a person who wanted to make things good again. After his warm reception in the capital by the Minister of the Interior, I escorted Friedrich Paulus to Dresden on the 25th October 1953, where he occupied a house on the Weissen Hirsch. Naturally, the winter battle on the Volga was our main topic of conversation. It has not been easy for me over the past years, said Paulus. However, 
I believe I have drawn the right conclusions. Please read my declaration, which I issued upon leaving the Soviet Union. He handed me a document that I read with growing pleasure, although it contained a sober, well-thought-out decision. As leader of the German troops in the Battle of Stalingrad, so faithful for my fatherland, I have learnt down to the roots about all the horrors of the War of Conquest, not only for the Soviet people we fell upon, but also for my own soldiers, the lessons of my own experience, as well as those learnt during the course of the whole World War, have led me to the knowledge that the fate of the German people cannot be formed from thoughts of power, but rather from a lasting friendship with the Soviet Union, as well as with all peace-loving peoples. Therefore, it seems to me that thoughts of peaceful war agreements also being pursued in the West are not the only suitable means for a peaceful reconstruction of German unity and ensuring peace in Europe. Through these agreements, much more dangerous would be the increasing and prolonging of the division of Germany. I am therefore convinced that the only real way to a friendly reunification of Germany and a progression to peace can only be achieved by a peace treaty on the basis of the Soviet note to the Western powers on the German question of the 15th August of this year. Therefore, I have also decided, after returning to my homeland to put all my strength in cooperating to achieve the honorable goal of a peaceful reunification of Germany and the friendship of the German people with the Soviet people, as well as with all other peace-loving peoples. I do not want to leave the Soviet Union without saying to the Soviet people that I once came in blind obedience as an enemy of your country, but now I am leaving it as a friend of your country. Our officers had passed to me a request for Friedrich Paulus to give a lecture at the Academy on the Battle on the Volga. In the course of the visit I brought him this request and added that two days had been set aside for it in May 1954. He was immediately in agreement and soon set to work on it. He prepared sketch maps from memory and on the basis of notes that we had made in the first year of our captivity after talks with generals and staff officers. At the end of April he invited me to visit him. We talked about his thoughts in broad outline. I asked him too if his lecture dealt with the reasons for the German defeat. Of course, he said. I think something along these lines. The main reason for the German catastrophe at Stalingrad, as for the whole disastrous course of the war, lay in the fatal underestimation of the Soviet Union by the German Army High Command and the over-evaluation of its own possibilities. The German war leadership followed adventurous and rapacious aims. They thought that the Soviet state would fall apart under the blows of the German Wehrmacht, but it showed, despite the worst test, an unprecedented steadfastness. The Soviet commanders demonstrated high military competence and the soldiers of the Soviet army defended their homeland with amazing tenacity and bravery, as it stood unshackably behind them and delivered them ever more and ever better weapons. That is how the Soviet High Command's plans for the Stalingrad battle could run like clockwork and lead to a basic change in the course of the Second World War. I could only confirm this appraisal. You remember how we crossed the Don in August 1944. We knew that a hard battle awaited us. However, no one believed that the Red Army would defend itself with such determination and ferocity. Where did the enemy soldiers and officers get their strength? We could find no satisfactory answer at the time. Only in captivity did the veil lift from these secrets. We got to know what socialism and communism meant to these people. For hundreds of years it was suppressed, deprived, and trampled on. In October 1917 the hour of freedom hit them. To us much of what was happening in the East seemed incomprehensible. The Soviet people on the other hand knew what they had, why they were superior to us. They knew what they were fighting and dying for. I can understand, said Paulus, how today in West Germany these simple truths are denied by the generals despite their own experiences. However, we must let the whole world know and finally understand that the future of the German people must be based not on might and power, but rather on friendship with all peace-loving peoples, especially the Soviet Union. The one-time simple soldier had learned to view world events through political eyes, from the man who previously had to resolve the conflict between orders and knowledge and obedience to senseless orders, a political person had emerged who was willing to commit his strength and knowledge to the prevention of war and the peaceful reunification of Germany. This was also detected by the officers of the high school, among whom Friedrich Paulus was neither enhanced by nor blamed for his description of the battle. He concluded his presentation with the words, 
all peace-loving people can only be horrified that today in West Germany a policy is being followed that has the same dangerous side to it as the previous history of the Second World War. The Paris and Bonn agreements are leading the Federal Republic along the same paths that led in the Second World War to Stalingrad and then ended in a national catastrophe. This made a deep impression, and many were obliged to revise their former skeptical condemnation of Paulus as a man. Fully in the spirit of his Dresden lecture, Paulus then turned to an international press conference in Berlin on the 2nd July 1954, which was conducted against the so-called politics of the strong by Professor Albert Morton. Among other things he said, since my return to Germany last year I have been impressed even more strongly that high-ranking American politicians and soldiers talk and work on the German question as if the Second World War had not even occurred, although it ended with such a frightful defeat on German soil. But what strikes and moves me much more is the fact that in West Germany in the highest governmental positions, and also in the press and on the radio, Exactly the same attitude is taken and esteemed about all lessons of the past renewing the policy of strength, representing and supporting a policy of preparing for war on German soil. Paulus was of the firm opinion that the German question must be resolved by negotiations between the Germans in the East and the West. The plans for the rearmament of West Germany and the inclusion of West German divisions in the NATO forces gave him no rest. On a Sunday morning towards the end of 1954, he told me that he had decided to make a speech to former officers of the German Democratic Republic and the Federal Republic. Numerous letters, especially from West Germany, had strongly reinforced him in his project. I was astonished how much work he had already done on it. I will make clear to the West German participants that the Paris agreements on the reunification of Germany prevent and deepen the division of Germany. I want to demonstrate that a policy of strength can no longer lead to success. We former officers must assist the Germans from here and there to understand each other. You believe that the former officers who have lived in West Germany since 1945 will go along with this argument. It will not be easy for them. Certainly they will bring up the old argument of the unpolitical officer about whom we often heard during captivity. I will then recall how we got there. It must be clear to the officer that through his unpolitical behavior he became the greatest political tool. He must be subjective in dealing in good faith, as we did at the Volga. By blind compliance with orders we were objectively also guilty of criminal conduct. How unscrupulously did Hitler misuse our unpolitical attitude to the damage of the German people and to the shame of the German name? During these last words Paulus had risen from his chair and strode off across the big room. Then he stopped, standing in front of me. That, my dear Adam, is what especially those former officers think that let them obtain the West German military contingent from the government of the Federal Republic. One day the German people will ask them the direct question, what did you do then for the unity and sovereignty of our fatherland? What have you done for peace? I reinforced Paulus in his thoughts. He nodded in agreement and picked up a sheet of paper. I want to conclude my discourse with an appeal to all the assembled comrades, including all other officers and soldiers in the East and West, to unite our fatherland. Don't be silent on those who must be involved in Germany's existence and future. It was an impressive experience when Friedrich Paulus spoke in Berlin on the 29th January 1955, after the sounds of the old German soldier's song Ich hat ein Kameradin had accompanied our remembrances of the fallen former officers from East and West Germany. Most of them thought inwardly and vowed never again. I was convinced that many West German participants also made this vow. However, the number of inflexible Hitler generals who dipped their pens deep into the ink for their memoirs increased. The one that annoyed Paulus most of all was Manston's book Verlorin Sieg lost victory. When I was with him again in the summer of 1956, he brought it out, this you must read yourself. According to what it says here, Manstein is completely blameless for the destruction of the Sixth Army. This man writes knowing the truth, but ascribes all the blame to me and Hitler. You yourself heard almost all the talks I had with him over the decimetre apparatus. You know how he kept back from me the true situation at the front and paralyzed my freedom of action. And now he prints all this, the former commander-in-chief of Army Group Don. He falsifies the facts to hide the real truth from our people. 
This man I once regarded highly. Now he lies with all the others who sailed the old course away from their equal responsibility for the downfall of the Sixth Army, their equal responsibility for the war and its bitter end. As long as I live, I will try to negate this attempt to wash his hands of the business. Manstein, the Army High Command and the Wehrmacht High Command, and all of us who from the beginning approved and pursued Hitler's policies are guilty of this misfortune. Anyone who has even a spark of honor in them must admit and tell the people the truth, so that we never again come to a Stalingrad. Paulus' late insights were especially valuable to our people. Spoken by a former expert on wars of conquest, today they belong to the foundation of a necessary turnaround in West German policy. Unfortunately, Paulus' health was getting worse. He often had to interrupt his work. His intention of writing a history of the battle on the Volga remained incomplete. On the 1st February 1957, 14 years after the end of the great battle, he closed his eyes forever. I had lost a good friend and comrade. Painfully, I took my farewell of Friedrich Paulus, whose fate had been so closely entangled with mine for 15 decisive years of life. More than 20 years have now passed since that decisive battle on the Volga. Many of those who survived it are no longer with us. Those who at that time were in their prime of life are rapidly approaching the grave. And even the youngest survivors of the participants in that great winter battle are today close to 50 years old. Thus, the number of living witnesses to the German tragedy on the Volga are diminishing. Thus, all the more important are the written accounts and the works that contain their knowledge and experience. I am fortunate to be able to be in Germany as the new age breaks, the age of socialism. The way was not easy and it will not be easy in the future. But the way was and is the right one. It is the only possible consequent alternative to the way of wars of conquest that came to an end on the Volga. Never again will a war start from German soil. No, never again may our fatherland raise the fury of war. Germany is not to become an atomic graveyard. All will is and is to be done to establish a blooming German fatherland with an order of society that excludes imperial arbitrariness and military demons. An order of society that with the prosperity of its people enjoys national sovereignty and dignity, social equality and the friendship of other peoples, and an order of society that is firmly grounded. That is the bequest of the dead and the survivors of the frightful battle on the Volga.